Robert Poland is the Distinguished Professor of Economics and Co-Director of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Most recently, Professor Poland and his Perry research team published their in-depth analysis, economic analysis, of Medicare for All, what we call the Perry study. He showed that the question is not how on earth are we going to pay for it, but what on earth are we going to do with all the money we save? <laughs> Behind every bill worth even debate in Congress is a lot of study and a lot of analysis. Well, most of you heard uh, Senator Sanders reply during the debate, I know what's in it because I wrote the damn bill. Well, Professor Poland wrote the damn study. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me. And as I've said to the organizers already, uh, having been on both sides, being a speaker and being an organizer of events, being a speaker is a whole lot easier than being an organizer. So I appreciate the work that all the organizers have done and will continue to do, I'm sure, in behalf of this issue. So I'm just here to give you uh, an overview of the damn study that we wrote uh, at the request of uh, Senator Sanders and actually working on an extension of that study now for Congresswoman Jayapal uh, for her bill which actually has some features of it that are an improvement relative to what was in the Sanders original 2017 bill. So, I'm an economist and that means I talk about numbers and things going up and things going down. And so I, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna uh, give you some basic evidence on uh, this idea of Medicare for all, what it really means and um, how it affects people in terms of the, what we know, what is the evidence. And uh, yeah, we did do this damn study. Uh, it's over 200 pages long. Uh, whether it's good or not, it's definitely way more detailed than anything anybody else had done before, which I, I actually found to be a surprise because it's not like the issue hasn't been around at all, but then when I started looking at some of these other studies, uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, meat in it. Well, we can get to that later, okay. So what's the question, so we've got a big study, but there's really some simple questions. Uh, the biggest simple question is, uh, when we say Medicare for all, what are we really thinking about? What we're really thinking about is, can we design a healthcare system um, that will provide good quality, universal coverage for everyone with no cost sharing, in other words, no co-pays, no deductibles, no premiums, uh, um, at all, that you walk in and you have equal access, equal right to health care. So that's the first question, can we do that? Secondly, can we do it in a way that also saves money, that doesn't uh, explode the budget as some of the critics have charged it will? And the answer to both questions is yes. The answer to both questions is undeniably yes. It, there's really not much to debate in terms of the pure analytic questions. That is, can you design a fair universal system uh, and can you do it in a way that saves money? And why I say it's obviously true is because uh, every other advanced economy in the world is already doing it. Uh, not even close. Uh, so as, Sh as Shannon just said, I'll just give some numbers behind what she was just saying. So if we look at uh, the UK, Canada, Germany, France, uh, Australia, Japan. So those countries are spending between $3,500 and $5,500 per person on health care. That translates to about 9 to 11 percent of their overall economy, their GDP. Uh, and we, the US, are spending about $10,000 per person. So roughly twice as much. We're spending roughly twice as much per person, which also amounts to about 18% of GDP, and we're getting worse outcomes. Uh, there, there's no debating that. This is objectively true. 
when you look at, say, a, uh, a, one of the best measures of healthcare performance, uh, which is amenable mortality rates, that is, deaths that could be avoided through medical intervention. The United States ranks 34th in the world, and we're spending roughly twice as much as other economies. So, as a research question, can the United States design a system that is universally accessible, good quality, and lower cost? All we have to do is copy what other countries are doing. And we don't have to copy exactly, but we copy more or less, and we take uh, the features of these other countries. And essentially, when we did the research, that's basically what we did. Uh, we looked at what other countries are doing. We looked at ways that we transition into uh, something, some version of that, and you have Medicare for all. So let me just give you some, some of the highlights of our study. So the first uh, detailed question is, what, and, and responding to critics, okay, you're going to give people universal coverage, you don't have to pay anything. You can go to the doctor whenever you want. Uh, and isn't that going to explode costs? Because everyone will just be going to the doctor all the time. Now, of course, that's the most fun thing anyone wants to do is go to the doctor. We just love, especially if you want surgery. I mean, come on. Isn't that fun to get knee surgery when you don't need it, even if it's free? So uh, the, the question is, uh, how much will uh, care, how much will utilization of the system go up? How much will demand go up? And it will go up. It will. We actually want it to go up. That's part of the point. Because, uh, as our speakers have already said, we have a system in which we have roughly 9%, uh, uh, 26 million people in the country who are uninsured right now. Uh, then we have uh, another roughly 85 million people. Uh, and that's 26% of the population that are what we call underinsured. Meaning, they have insurance but they can't afford to get sick anyway. Because when they get sick, they can't afford the deductibles, they can't afford the copays. So they go without treatment. This is over a quarter of the US population is under uh, this uh, category, underinsured. So we're roughly talking about 35% of the population that are uninsured or underinsured. All of those people will be able to get the coverage they need under uh, uh, Medicare for all. That's a given. So yes, demand for health care will go up because all these people who are not getting care will get care. On top of that, we have the other 65% of the population, most of whom live in fear of ever getting sick because it will uh, bankrupt them. That also goes away. So everyone will feel uh, that they are confident, they don't have to worry about changing jobs, they don't have to worry about losing their jobs, no matter what, they will have health care. That's what we mean by health care is a human right. Everybody gets it. Now, so the cost will go up. In, in our study, we assume that the cost, of looking at the research, we said the system cost will go up by about 12%. That number, by the way, our estimate was deliberately high, sig uh, higher than the figure that, if you heard about this study put out, by this, it's called the Mercatus Institute, that's funded by the Koch brothers. And their study, people said, oh, uh, you know, my study is, you know, way exaggerating things. Well, my, my study actually said that the cost of the system will go up more than what the Koch brothers sponsored study said. And the reason is because we want people to have the right to, to get the care they need. So we assume costs go up by 12% for the system. But then, then what? Well, this is the critical feature of Medicare for All, that, the, that we get massive savings at the same time. We get savings because we cut out the useless private insurance intermediaries. They're gone. Now, if you, if you look, and this is strict, you know, official government data, uh, private health insurance uh, expenditures on, quote, administration, which means a lot of paper shuffling, a lot of credentialing, uh, a lot of denials, work to deny people, and then of course profits, and of course advertising. Now that adds up to 12% of their costs. Now then you compare it with the, private, the public Medicare, our existing Medicare system, it's 
12% versus 2%. Well, when you're talking about a three and a half trillion dollar system, that 10 percentage points of cost is massive. We're talking about $2 trillion here. So uh, we are going to get those savings uh, from eliminating all the useless administrative activity and the advertising and the excessive profits that Shannon was just talking about. That's the first big source of saving. The second big source of saving is with uh, pharmaceutical prices. If you look at other uh, economies, uh, there's really, again, there's no debate. The other countries in uh, the Western European countries, Japan, Australia, Canada, they're spending roughly half of what we're spending on pharmaceuticals, on prescription drugs, half. And they're mostly the same, drug, same exact drugs spending half because in this country we don't, bar we don't use the power of the government to bargain down prices, whereas they do in the other countries. So there are other sources of savings, but those are going to be the two big ones. When we add it up, we estimate, I would argue again conservatively, you get almost 20% less cost per person than you do uh, under our existing system. Medicare for all builds in these massive costs. And so the net result is we can get universal coverage, everybody has free access to the system, uh, no barriers in terms of cost sharing, and we save about 9% overall. That, and again, is a conservative estimate because conservative in the sense that we would still be paying significantly more uh, relative to what other countries are paying. I'm not saying we're going to look exactly like Canada. I'm saying we're going to go maybe a third of the way to where Canada is, and we still get massive savings. So uh, that's the key. Now, what does it mean in terms of, uh, in terms of how individuals pay for this and businesses? Well, there's different ways you can think about financing the system, but in the way we did it, um, we said, look, businesses are already used to paying premiums. And by the way, this notion, I'll talk, talk a little bit more about it in a minute, this notion that people can't, can't conceive of giving up their private health, system, health care that they get from their private business. Private businesses are changing their health care, private uh, insurers, all the time. 17% of private businesses change per year, per year. So this is no big deal to then do a one-time transfer to Medicare for All. Now, if they do that in the way we designed it, all the private businesses that are covering uh, their workers today, they would all pay 8% less than they pay now. So in other words, if a private business is paying a million dollars per year to cover its workers, tomorrow when Medicare for All starts, they're going to pay $920,000. From a million to $920,000. I think businesses like this idea. I know it's going to work for them. Now what about households? Uh, in the way we designed it, the big, 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 big winners here are the middle class. The middle class, uh, if you are paying an individual uh, and buying in insurance on the exchange as an individual now, what we estimate, if you take a, a middle class family with an income of $60,000, uh, they're going to save over $8,000 a year. This is a 14% savings, giving people a 14% improvement in their net income, in their living standard. This is a massive benefit. So this notion that people can't, can't conceive of giving up their private health care when they're going to save $14,000 and have universal care and not have to worry at all about co-pays, uh, deductibles, getting sick, losing their jobs, not being able to change jobs, uh, you know, this is a massive, massive benefit. So let me just address quickly the t uh, two of the big political questions that come up, have come up in the campaign. The first is this thing, oh, how the hell are you going to pay for this? How? And Biden keeps bringing this up. Biden says, do you realize that Medicare for all is going to cost $3 trillion? Yes. Do you realize, Mr. Former Vice President, that our current system pay, costs $3.5 trillion? That's the part that he leaves out. He's, he's right to say it'll cost $3 trillion or thereabouts. He's. Uh, He's only telling you a bit of the story because what he doesn't tell you is that it's going to save $400 billion relative 
to our existing system. It's cheaper. So every time you hear Biden or any other candidate say, my God, this is going to cost three trillion dollars. Your response has to be right, and that is four hundred billion dollars less than we're paying now. Uh, so that's the big, big one. Now the, the other big one that I've heard in the campaign is that 150 million people have private health insurance through their employer, which they do, and they want to keep it because they like it. I don't believe that. <laughs> I believe what people like is having guaranteed health care, being able to see the provider that they want, and not going bankrupt or not being able to get the care they want. So if you, here's the question you ask, not the question, do you like who your private uh, insurer is? The question is, do you want to have a health care system in which you are guaranteed for life, your children, your family, are guaranteed to life to have decent health care at lower costs, that you can see the provider that you want to see. You are always guaranteed. You will not be inhibited by your health insurer as to which providers you can see. Do you want that kind of a system? The answer is inevitably yes. And when people, when you ask the question, do you want Medicare for all, and people uh, connect with these benefits of Medicare for all, the, the answer 70, 75% of the time is yes. So Medicare for all is a viable system. It is a system that has proven to work in other countries. Uh, we can build on the successes in other countries. We, we can create a system which is truly transformative in the sense that it makes healthcare a human right, period. Thank you.